Hello students, today I am going to explain another important topic of the first unit of the advanced level chemistry syllabus. During the last lesson, we discussed about the periodic table, the way how modern periodic table was constructed and we identified groups, periods, blocks of the periodic table and the relationship between the electron configuration and the position of the element in the periodic table. You know that the common electron configuration is directly related to the position of the periodic table or the common or the valential electron configuration is directly related to the position especially the group of the periodic table to which that particular element belongs. And we understood about the characteristics of the elements in terms of their metallic, non-metallic character and also the physical nature of those elements whether they are solids, liquids and gases. So, today we are going to study the trends of the properties of the elements shown by the trends of the properties of the elements when you move across a period of the periodic table or when you move down a particular group of the periodic table. Now, according to the syllabus, you are supposed to know about the variation of the properties given here, atomic radius and the variation, ionization energy, electron gain energy, electronegativity, those are the main properties that you are supposed to know. Before I explain these properties one by one, I will take few minutes to explain you few important things and trends of the periodic table again which is related to the lesson done during the last time and after that we will explain another point that is about the nuclear charge, the effective nuclear charge and the shielding effect. So, if you look at the periodic table, modern periodic table again, there we understood that these elements belong to different blocks as mentioned here S block, P block, D block and F block and we learned group numbers. Now, if you look at the main group elements, in unit 1 we mainly focus on S and P block elements, but in inorganic chemistry we discuss about the D block elements as well. Now, if you look at the main group elements here, across a period when you move from left to right and also in a particular group when you move from top to bottom you should know how these properties vary. All these things can be related to the electron configuration of the particular element, electron configuration of the particular element. Now, one important thing is among these main group elements, when you move across a period from left to right, that means this way, the metallic character of the element decreases the metallic property decreases, the non-metallic nature of the element increases. Metals mainly react by removing electrons, that means they have a higher ability to form cations. In other words, their ionization energies related to the removal of outer electrons are relatively low, therefore they have a higher tendency to form cations. When you move from left to right, of these main group elements, you can see the valence shell is getting filled, the number of electrons in the valence shell increases. These elements valence shell contains one, two like few, ele few electrons, one electron, two electrons like that ns1, ns2, but when moving towards the right hand side, number of electrons in the energy level increases. As a result, the tendency to form cations decreases 
and tendency to form anions increases. For example, in the right hand side you can see NS2, NP6, NS2, NP5, those configurations where the outer shell or the valent shell is nearly filled. That means you need only one or two electrons to complete the electron octet or to gain the very stable NS2, NP6 configuration. Therefore, when moving from left to right, the tendency to remove electrons decreases, that means tendency to form cations decreases, tendency to form anions increases. Accordingly, the metallic character decreases, the non-metallic character increases, non-metallic character increases. Also, now you can understand very easily at this point, on moving down a particular group, the principal quantum number of the last electron increases, that means the size of the atom increases size of the atom on moving down the group increases. So, these things are important to understand before we discuss the periodic properties. Now, most of these properties as I mentioned earlier, they depend on the electron configuration of the elements, especially the outer electron configuration. That means, basically the strength of that outer electrons attracted to the nucleus. We know that in atoms, nucleus is there and electrons they are in energy levels, even from your O level knowledge you have represented like this. Now electrons are attracted to the nucleus. The strength or the how strong the valential electrons are attracted to the nucleus is one very important factor which determine the properties of the elements because for chemical reactions valential electrons are the electrons which involve. So, there you can see many properties of the atoms depend on their electron configuration and how strongly the out electrons are attracted to the nucleus. Coulomb's law is the one which we can use to explain the strength of the interaction between the two electrical charges that means nucleus and the outer electrons. If you consider one outer shell electron and the strength of that electron or the attraction of that electron to the nucleus can be explained from the Coulomb's law. For example, if this is the outer shell electron, this is the nucleus, then if the distance between these two is let us say r, then according to the Coulomb's law, since they are opposite charges, there is an attractive force that attraction given by Coulomb's law regarding two electrical charges can be given like this. If you just think this as one electrical charge, this as one electrical charge, it is given by a constant this part is a constant 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Q1 and Q2 are the magnitudes of the electrical charges respectively divided by R square. That means you can understand if these charges are greater, the force of attraction between the two charges will be greater. And also if the distance between the charges increases, that means if the distance between the charges is high, then force of attraction will be low. Now, attractive force between an electron and the nucleus depends on the magnitude of the nuclear charge and on the average distance between nucleus and that particular electron. So, that is what is explained earlier. Now, you can see that when the charge, nuclear charge, what is meant by the nuclear charge? Nuclear charge is the number of protons in the nucleus. So, when the number of protons increases, it is clear now that attraction, force of attraction between the electrons and the nucleus should increase. The force increases as the nuclear charge increases and decreases as the electron moves further from the nucleus. That means distance, average distance between the nucleus and the electron when it increases, the force of attraction decreases. In an atom containing large number of electrons, that means polyelectronic atoms, atoms containing more than one electron. When it comes to such atoms, in addition to that direct attractive force, some of the electrons inside that atom, that means 
apart from the valence shell electron, the electrons in the inner shells, they repel each other, electron-electron repulsions there. So, in addition to the attractions of electron to the nucleus, each electron experiences a repulsion due to the proximity of the other electrons. Since electrons are close together in orbitals, there are electron-electron repulsions that also you have to consider. These electron-electron repulsions cancel some of the attractions of the electrons to the nucleus so that the electron experiences less attraction than it would be if the other electrons were not there, very important. So, some of these electrons experience, that means some of these attractive forces get cancelled out due to the electron-electron repulsions. As a result of that, some of these electrons experience attractive forces which are less compared to the situation where no other electrons are present. Right? We will repeat that point. So, the electron experiences less attraction than would than it would if the other electrons were not there. That is important. That means, always in polyelectronic systems or atoms containing more than one electron, the valence shell electron experiences an attraction which is less than the attraction expected because of the electron-electron repulsions. The outer electrons are said to be screened or shielded from the nucleus by the inner electrons close to the nucleus and this phenomenon is termed as screening effect or shielding effect. Just consider one common example sodium. If you look at sodium atom, we know that uh, nucleus you have 11 protons, let us say plus 11 and first energy level 2 electrons second energy level we know 8 electrons, last energy level 1 electron. Now, when it comes to that last energy level that is the electron which is involved in all these reactions shown by sodium. So, that is the most important electron in terms of the chemistry of the sodium atom. So, when you consider that electron, that electron and the nucleus in between you have 10 more electrons. So, those electrons contain or those electrons exert electron-electron repulsions. Those repulsions will definitely reduce or decrease the attraction between that valence shell electron and the nucleus. So, we can say the attraction is somewhat shielded by the inertial electrons. So, the nuclear charge, this nucleus is shielded by the inertial electrons. Nucleus is shielded by we call co-electrons because last shell or the valence shell electrons they are called valence electrons, the other electrons in between nucleus and the valence shell they are called co-electrons. So, co-electrons shield the nuclear charge. So, that effect is called the screening effect or shielding effect. An electron therefore experiences a net attraction by the nucleus that is less than it would be in the absence of the other electrons. This partially screened nuclear charge is termed as the effective nuclear charge. So, this is called the effective nuclear charge. He said effective, effective nuclear charge. Effective nuclear charge is always less than the nuclear charge. What is nuclear charge? the number of protons. So, effective nuclear charge is definitely less than the nuclear charge. Effective nuclear charge is the actual charge felt by the actual charge related to the actual attraction felt by that particular valence shell electron being considered that will not feel the attraction related to the actual nuclear charge because the nucleus is shielded by inertial electrons. So, effective nuclear charge is always less than the nuclear charge. Here is said effective is the effective nuclear charge. This is the symbol used and is said represents the nuclear charge or the proton number of the nucleus. For a valence electron, most of the shielding is due to the co-electrons which are much closer to the nucleus. 
as a result the greater number of co electrons and the higher number of co shells the great as a result the greater the number of co electrons and higher the number of inner shells co shells the greater will be the screening effect or shielding effect so shielding effect increases when the number of inner shell electrons and number of inner shells or the co electron shells increases the effective nuclear charge increases from left to right across any period of the periodic table now we have come to the point the effective nuclear charge across a period of main group elements increases from left to right increases from left to right although the number of co electrons stays the same across a period number of protons increases now when you move from left to right of a particular period let's consider second period lithium to neon when you move from left to right the number of co electrons remains the same but number of protons increases so co electrons are the ones which mainly contribute for the shielding so one can say the shielding effect is almost remain unchanged there may be slight changes but almost unchanged or nearly the same but number of protons of the nuclear charge increases as the increase of the nuclear charge and due to the fact that shielding effect does not change significantly the nuclear charge minus the effect from the shielding increases that means the effective nuclear charge increases when moving across the period from left to right the valence valence shell electrons are added to counterbalance the nu increasing nuclear charge thus screens in effectively thus effective nuclear charge increases steadily across the period valence shell electrons which are added when you move across the period they are added to the valence shell that means last energy level they will not contribute for the shielding effect effectively that is why effective nuclear charge increases across a period steadily now you can understand what is effective nuclear charge and how the effective nuclear charge varies across a period of especially main group elements main group elements when it comes to the d block elements and f block elements actually the last electron is not added to the valence shell they are also added to the inner shells therefore they are shielding due to the increase in the number of electrons when moving across the period is more effective compared to the s and p block elements so we don't consider we don't discuss the variation of the effective nuclear charge or the variation of these atomic properties of d block elements in this topic but that is important for the inorganic chemistry that will be discussed under unit 6 now here we mainly focus on main group elements that means basically s and p block elements so we'll first discuss about the first atomic property that is the atomic radius and its variation first thing is you should understand what is meant by the atomic radius and the fact that why we cannot measure the atomic radius accurately the number one the first point or the main point you have to understand is when you consider atoms we know that electrons are present or electrons are inside the atomic orbitals an atomic orbital is defined as a region in the three dimensional space where the probability of finding of an electron is high so no one can give an exact boundary or exact location for the electron we can just define a probable region of the electron electrons probable region that is the orbital therefore we cannot define sharp boundaries for atoms we cannot define sharp boundaries for atoms that is one reason and on the other hand if you look at the periodic table you know that most of the elements are metals and there are non metals and also some elements in the gas phase some elements in the solid state some elements in the liquid state and some elements are 
present as diatomic molecules, some are present as polyatomic molecules, some elements like uh, for example metals they exist as metallic lattices or they are present in the pure form in different combined states. That means you cannot find isolated atoms in when you consider these elements in the pure form. Only group 18 elements will exist in the form of isolated atoms. Other elements you cannot find them in the isolated atomic states. Therefore, it is very difficult or it, you cannot measure the atomic radii, free atomic radius. That means basically the distance between the last energy level or the valence electrons and the nucleus cannot be measured accurately for free atoms or the free atomic radius cannot be measured. Therefore, based on the nature how these atoms or how these elements exist, whether they are exist as existing as molecules, diatomic molecules, polyatomic molecules or lattices, then based on the way how these elements exist, we have to define different ways of measuring atomic radius based on the way how these, are, these things are measured and the based on the nature of the particular element, we define different types of atomic radii. So, we are going to discuss different types of atomic radii and the way how atomic radius varies across a period as well as down the group. Now, atoms are not hard spherical objects as many of us think. According to the quantum model, quantum mechanical model, atoms do not have sharply defined boundaries. Now, you know because of the thing that we cannot give an exact position with 100 percent accuracy for the particular uh, electron being considered. So, we can define atomic size in several ways based on the distance between atoms in various situations. Based on the distance between atoms under different conditions, atomic radius can be defined in number of ways. Now, there are three main ways we define covalent radius, van der Waals radius and metallic radius. Let us see how these are defined and the differences between these different types of atomic radii. If you look at covalent radius, I will first give you the correct definition, then we will see further detail. Now, covalent radius is defined like this. When there is a particular atom which forms a single covalent bond with an atom of the same element, let us say chlorine, chlorine molecule you have Cl, Cl single bond. So, this molecule will be like this. So, chlorine you have two atoms of the same element forming a single covalent bond. We can measure the distance between the two nuclei of the two atoms of the same element bonded through this single covalent bond. We can estimate and we can measure the positions of nuclei of different matter using X-rays. So, once the positions of these nuclei are determined, the distance between those two nuclei can be measured. Experimental techniques are available especially X-ray diffraction methods, they allow us to obtain these type of measurements. Now, if you can measure the distance between two nuclei of the two atoms bonded through a single covalent bond, half the distance, half the distance between these two nuclei is known as the covalent radius or in other words, it is called single covalent bond radius or the bonding atomic radius, single covalent bond radius or bonding atomic radius. So, chemical bond is the attractive interaction between any two adjacent atoms in a molecule. The two bonded atoms are closer together than they would be in non-bonding collision. Now, when two atoms are bonded, their nuclei are closer than a situation where they are not bonded. That means, if you consider the adjacent chlorine molecule of the sample like this, the next molecule. Now, when these molecules collide with each other, 
the, when these molecules collide with each other, they will come very close, but still there is a distance between them. Right? Here I have drawn two chlorine molecules. Distance between two nuclei of the two atoms of the same element bonded through a single covalent bond is less compared to the distance between two atoms of the same element which are not bonded, but when they are present as close as possible, still you have a separation or you have a distance greater than this. So, this distance can be measured, let us say this is D, so I can measure this one experimentally. So, D divided by 2 is the covalent radius. When you consider this non-bonding atoms of the same element, if you measure this distance, this one that means these two nuclei, this distance let us say D1, half that distance is known as a van der Waals radius. So, bonding atomic radius is always greater than the non-bonding atomic radius. So, covalent radius is measured like this. So, there must be a particular element which form a single covalent bond between the atoms of the same element. So, if you measure the distance, half the distance is the covalent radius. So, bonding atomic radius for any atom in a molecule is equal to half the bond distance. That should be actually half the single bond distance of the bond formed between the two atoms of the same element. Then bonding radius also known as the covalent radius is half the distance between nuclei of the two atoms of the same element bonded through a single covalent bond. It is smaller than the non-bonding atomic radius, it is smaller than the non-bonding atomic radius. In this case, uh, the example given for iodine here. Now, you can see uh, two atoms of this same molecule, they are you have a covalent bond between these two atoms. So, half the distance is the covalent radius. So, this distance is measured, half of that you can say 133 picometers, that is 10 to the power minus 12 meters. Uh, is a covalent radius. Now, non-bonding atomic radius is also known as the van der Waals radius that is the distance between two atoms of the same element in two different molecules. That means, when they are in the non-bonded state, but also when they are close as possible, these atoms can come very close together upon collision. So, when they are very close together, but still not bonded that is called van der Waals radius or non-bonding atomic radius. So, that is always greater than the bonding atomic radius or covalent radius. From this example, you can understand clearly that for this type of a molecule, we can define covalent radius as well as van der Waals radius, but covalent radius or the bonding atomic radius is always less than the non-bonding atomic radius. Bonding atomic radius is always less than the non-bonding atomic radius. Right, van der Waals radius is called non-bonding atomic radius is half of the distance between two equivalent non-bonded atoms in their most stable arrangement. That is, where the attractive forces are maximum. Upon collision, when they come very close to each other, half the distance between the two nuclei of two non-bonded atoms of the same element is the van der Waals radius, that is the van der Waals radius. Then we will see what is meant by the metallic radius. Now, you know what is covalent radius and what is van der Waals radius. Now, covalent radius can mainly be applied for non-metals and when they are bonded through single covalent bonds between the two atoms of the same element, single covalent bonds. Now, do not think that you can measure the bond length of uh, oxygen molecule and express half that bond length as covalent radius of oxygen, that is wrong. So, it is always single covalent bond radius, right, single covalent bond radius. So, chlorine for example, chlorine, chlorine single bond there, if you measure the bond length, bond length means distance between the two chlorine atoms there, distance between the two nuclei of two chlorine atoms, that is the bond length. For example, 
chlorine, this bond length can be measured. Half the bond length is the covalent radius of chlorine. But when it comes to molecules like nitrogen, O oxygen, where you have multiple bonds, that means atoms are more close compared to the situation where there are single bonds, you cannot measure the covalent radii using these type of molecules for these elements. For example, in order to measure the covalent radius of oxygen, you need to use a molecule where oxygen oxygen single bond is there. That is what is called single covalent radius, single covalent bond radius, right. Right, now when it comes to metallic radius, now that is mainly applied for metals and most of the elements in the periodic table, you know they are metals. Therefore, metallic radius, understanding metallic radius is also very important. Let us see what is meant by the metallic radius. Metallic radius is defined like this. First you have to understand the way how metals or the way how atoms in a metallic structure exist. Structure of a metal is explained by a particular model called electron C theory or electron gas theory, electron C theory or electron cloud theory or electron gas theory. It is very simple to understand. Just think about a metal like sodium or magnesium. Outer shell you have sod in sodium you have one electron. So, when you consider the structure of the metal in sodium, outer shell electrons are remote or they are we call donated and you have cations like this. So, these are sodium ions. These cations are very closely packed together. throughout the structure. The electron which was given out, those electrons, I will just represent using negative sign like this. They randomly move through this structure. You will learn more details about these structures in the second unit, they randomly move through the structure. So, this type of a structure is known as a metallic lattice where the cations formed are in fixed positions, we call localized cations and electrons, these electrons randomly move here and there. Now, when it comes to magnesium, there are two outer shell electrons, so plus two ion will be there more electrons will be there in the structure. So, we call that this is a structure composed of localized cations that means cations in fixed positions and delocalized electrons. So, cations embedded in a sea of electrons, cations embedded in a sea of electrons. So, electron C theory. Now, in this one, there are interactions, attractive forces between electrons and these cations, they are called metallic bonds. Now, in a structure like this, the metallic radius is defined like this. It is the distance between two nuclei. of two adjacent metal cations, distance between two nuclei, distance between two adjacent nuclei of this structure can be measured. Half of the distance d is the metallic radius. So, metallic radius is half the distance between two adjacent nuclei of the metal atoms or metal ions in the metallic that is, that is called the metallic radius. So, metal atoms in a metallic structure, they are bonded to each other by metallic bonds. So, this distance d then metallic radius, I can say 
d divided by 2. So, this d is here, right. Let us see the point given metal atoms in the metallic structure are bonded to each other by metallic bonds. Metallic bonds are these attractions between ions and electrons. Half the bond distance between the nuclei of two adjacent metal atoms in the metallic structure called the metallic radius. Now, in this structure, since electron cloud is all over there, that means around each metal ion you have electrons. Therefore, even if you use the term metal atom, it is okay, but we know that metal ions are there in the structure. When it comes to main group elements like S block metals, definitely that valential electrons are given out, that means they are donated to the sea of electrons. But when it comes to D block elements, D block elements we know that final electron added to D sub energy level of the penultimate shell. For example, if you consider say an element like iron, the electron configuration ends with 3D6, 4S2, 4S2, then 3D6. But when these elements are considered, in addition to those valence shell electrons, some of the D electrons are also delocalized or also donated to the sea of electrons. Therefore, such elements, there will be more electrons in that electron C, not like sodium or magnesium and also there will be a higher charge for the metal ion. So, you can expect stronger metallic bonds from such elements, right. So, half the bond distance between the nuclei of two adjacent metal atoms in the metallic structure is called the metallic radius. Then we will see the way how radius varies. Now, we discussed three types of radii, covalent radius, van der Waals radius, metallic radius. When it comes to a comparison, especially across a period, we know that there are metals, metalloids, non-metals, amphoteric metals, all types are there. Therefore, these different types of atomic radii, even though we define, if we consider different types of atomic radii for the comparison, we may not be able to get a good understanding or good idea about the way how atomic radius varies. Therefore, when it comes to a comparison, we consider one type of radius. Mainly, we compare the variation of the covalent radius. Then you might ask, then how covalent bonds are formed by some metals and how covalent bonds are formed by some of the noble gases or the group 18 elements like that. But in this particular case, when it comes to group 18 elements for example, we estimate the covalent radius for them. That means, if these elements, group 18 elements are going to form a covalent bond, form covalent bonds, what would be the radius that can be calculated? Estimated values are obtained for such elements which do not form covalent bonds. Uh, by getting those estimated values and experimental values, we can uh, get a series of atomic radii for the elements in the particular period, then we can use it for the comparison. So, when it comes to the periodic trends of the atomic radii, the atomic sizes within a period show two interesting trends. One is within each group, the atomic radius tend to increase from top to bottom. This is mainly due to the increase in the principal quantum number of the outer electrons that I explained earlier as well. So, down the group, any type of radius increases. As you go down a column, outer electrons have a greater probability of being further away from the nucleus, causing the atomic radius to increase. Within each period, the atomic radius generally tends to decrease from left to right. The major factor influencing the trend, this particular trend is increase in the effective nuclear charge. As the effective nuclear charge increases, valence shell electrons are strongly drawn towards the nucleus, decreasing the, decrease in the size of the atom. Increasing effective nuclear charge steadily draws the valence shell electrons closer to the nucleus, causing the atomic radius to decrease. So, across the period, it decreases, down the group, it increases. Now, you can see the variation of the atomic radius. Uh, here, they have considered the covalent radius. For noble gases, also estimated covalent radii given. There, you can see across second period elements, lithium to neon, you can see it decreases. Re what is the reason? Now, you know the reason. Reason is increase in the effective nuclear charge. So, lithium to neon decreases. then. 
again when you come to the next period first element sodium, when you compare with lithium, so down the group, so lithium, sodium, potassium down the group increases, radius increases, so it increases. So here this part you can see atomic radius decreases again, the same pattern is repeated, it decreases from sodium to argon, then potassium, calcium after that you get D block elements. In D block the situation is quite different, there is a slight decrease but variation is not very significant in D block, reason is in D block the final electron is added to an inner shell therefore shielding effect is more effective, therefore effective nuclear charge will not increase as expected, it increases slightly but it does not increase as expected as in the case of S and P blocks, S and P block elements across the period the effective nuclear charge steadily increases that is why atomic radius steadily decreases. But here the variation you can see there is a slight decrease but it is not very regular, the pattern is not very regular. We are discussing this part in detail under D block but here we mainly focus on S and P block elements, there the variation is very clear, you can see across the period it decreases. Now this same pattern will be repeated if you uh, neglect this part and potassium, calcium and after that these P block elements, this part and this part if you connect you can see the same pattern is there. So atomic radius decreases across a period of main group elements, increases down the group. Now here you can see the covalent radius again given for second period and third period elements, same pattern will be there, it decreases and from sodium to chlorine also it decreases, right. Now you know the variation of the atomic radius across the period as well as down the group with the reason, reason is also very important. Since the effective nuclear charge increases across the period of main group elements, the atomic radius decreases. Since the uh, principal quantum number increases for the valence shell electron down the group, the atomic radius increases down the group atomic radius decreases across the period, increases down the group. Then we will see the variation of the radii of ions. Like the sizes of atoms, the size of an ion also depends on its nuclear charge, the number of electrons it possesses and the orbitals in which the valence shell electrons reside. So it depends on the nuclear charge and the number of electron it possesses, that means basically the number of electronic energy levels and also the type of the orbital in which that valence shell electron is present. When the cation is formed from a neutral atom, electrons are removed from the occupied atomic orbital that are the most spatially extended from the nucleus that when cations are formed, electrons are removed from the occupied atomic orbitals which are most extended or further away from the nucleus which are further away from the nucleus. Also when cations are formed, the number of electron-electron repulsions reduce. We know that shielding effect comes to the picture due to the electron-electron repulsions. When the number of electron-electron repulsions are decreased, then we can say shielding effect also decreases. Therefore cations are smaller than the parent atoms, that means radius of a cation is always less than the radius of its neutral atom. When you consider anions, that means electrons are added to the atom, the increased electron-electron repulsions causes the electron to spread out more in space. When electrons are added to the atom, that means when anions are formed, electron-electron repulsions increases even though the nuclear charge remains unchanged. As a result of that, the radius of an anion is always greater than the radius of its neutral atom. Anions are larger than their parent atoms. So here you can see a comparison there, cations and anions. For example, lithium atom, its parent atom radius, that metallic radius is given there in green color that 152 picometers. Lithium plus ion you can see 60 picometers, there is a significant difference there, right. So that is uh, like one reason is that electrons are, that valence shell electrons are removed and no 
Now the valence shell is the first energy level, the other reason is in the first energy level electrons are strongly, more strongly drawn or attracted towards the nucleus of lithium plus. Likewise, you can see these metals, they form cations, cationic radius is always less, cationic radius is always less compared to the radius of the element. And when it comes to these nonmetals, they form anions, you can see the atomic radius is given below here, that 70 is the atomic radius of nitrogen and 171 is the anionic radius, 171 is the anionic radius. Now, radii of anions are always greater than radii of neutral atoms. Now, if you consider the radii of neutral atoms, now lithium 152, beryllium 111, then uh, boron carbon are not mentioned in this table, but after that nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. So, these are the atomic radii. So, you can see it decreases, atomic radius decreases across the period and down the group it increases 152, 186, 231, 244. Now, these two elements, for example, these are the diagonals of the periodic table. Across the diagonal, there is some sort of a similarity of the properties. You can see lithium atomic radius and magnesium atomic radius quite similar, quite close. And they are ionic radii also quite close, right? So these atomic radii quite close, but there is an increase. Across the diagonal also, radius increases. Across the diagonal also, radius increases, but there is a slight change, slight increase. Now, ionic radius increases as we move down a column, that means move down a group in the periodic table. In other words, as the principal quantum number of the outermost occupied orbital of an ion increases, the radius increases. When it comes to isoelectronic species, isoelectronic means atoms, ions or molecules, anything with the same number of electrons. But in this lesson, this part, we focus on monoatomic isoelectronic species. That means isoelectronic atoms, isoelectronic cations, isoelectronic anions, all are monoatomic. When you consider isoelectronic species, the variation of the radius is important. That is a group of ions or atoms containing same number of electrons. For example, each ion or atom in the isoelectronic series mentioned here, or oxide ion, oxide, fluoride, neon, sodium, magnesium, they all have 10 electrons. These are isoelectronic atoms and ions. So when isoelectronic series is considered, when the nuclear charge increases, the radius decreases. When isoelectronic series is considered, in any isoelectronic series, the nuclear charge increases with the increasing atomic number. When the atomic number increases, the radius decreases. In other words, in an isoelectronic series, when the charge of the cation increases, the radius decreases. When the charge of the anion increases, radius increases. So here, proton number 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. When the number of protons increases in the isoelectronic series, radius decreases. Because the number of electrons remains a constant, ionic radius decreases with the increase in the nuclear charge as the electrons are more strongly attracted to the nucleus. So in an isoelectronic series, you can compare that isoelectronic anions, they have the highest radii and then isoelectronic neutral atoms and then isoelectronic cations. In this particular case for neon, you must consider the estimated covalent radius in order to compare this. In order to put neon for this comparison, you have to use the covalent radius. Otherwise, if you use Van der Waals radius, it will be greater. Therefore, it cannot be fitted into this ra uh, variation, this comparison. If you use Van der Waals radius, you can't compare this. You must use covalent radius for neon if you are going to compare this isoelectronic series including neon. So because the number of electrons remain constant, the ionic radius decreases with the increase in the nuclear charge as the electrons are more strongly attracted to the nucleus. 
there you can see the idea there this electron configuration given here for the neutral atom. Configuration of the neutral atom here and here isoelectronic series is shown there when the proton number increases you can see radius decreases when the proton number increases the radius decreases. So, that is the idea of the isoelectronic series that how the way how the radius is compared for isoelectronic species isoelectronic means same number of electrons the species containing the same number of electrons they are known as isoelectronic species. We will consider another isoelectronic series to understand this further. If I give you species like uh, sulphide, this phosphide ion, fluoride, argon, potassium, calcium 2 plus and the variation of the radii of these isoelectronic species I can arrange. Now, you can see uh, sulphide ion this has 16 protons, here 15 protons, 17 protons, nuclear charge here 18, 19, 20. So, isoelectronic anions you have 3 anions here isoelectronic anions and out of these anions the highest negative charge this one and least number of protons here. So, P 3 minus that is the anion with the highest radius after that S 2 minus. So, in so when the atomic number increases radius decreases. So, this is the one with the highest radius then sulphide then fluoride. If you get the covalent radius of argon then you can face argon here. After that you have cations, potassium and calcium 2 plus. Now, it is clear that now cationic radius is less than the radius of a neutral atom also when you consider this isoelectronic species when the charge of a cation increases radius further decreases when the charge of the anion increases radius increases of the isoelectronic species basically you can understand in an in a series of isoelectronic species the radius decreases when the atomic number increases radius decreases when the atomic number increases right now i explain the variation of the effective nuclear charge and after that variation of the radius across the period as well as on moving down the group. Now, when you look at the periodic table and the variation of the atomic radius across these periods, period number 2, period number 3, there is a clear decrease in the atomic radius of period number 2 and 3 from group 1 element up to group uh, 17 element when it comes to covalent radius if you get the estimated covalent radius for group 18 element you can clearly say that atomic radius decreases across the period from left to right and down the group atomic radius increases and across the diagonal there is a slight increase in the atomic radius these are the diagonals across the diagonal there is a slight increase in the atomic radius not a very uh, significant increase, but there is a slight increase in the atomic radius that means atomic radius increases across the diagonal. When you consider d block elements the atomic radius across a period especially these fourth period d block elements we call 3 d elements scandium to sink these elements across a period atomic radius slightly decreases, but that change is not very regular right? that change is not very regular that is that's not a very steady decrease, but slight decrease can be observed. 
ok students now in the next lesson I wish to explain the variation of the ionization energy, electronegativity, electron gain energy and a few of the uh, important points related to the variation of these atomic properties. I hope you got a proper understanding about this topic today and that is another important one especially for the inorganic chemistry part and for unit 1 unit 1 general chemistry and general chemistry knowledge you gain is really important uh, to understand the inorganic chemistry parts in the syllabus because inorganic chemistry unit uh, that is a uh, fairly large unit and lots of things are there uh, related to the chemistry of this S block, P block and D block elements we learn in detail and you can watch these lessons again and again if you log into the YouTube channel channel NIE. So, have a nice day.